director of the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics here at the CUNY Graduate Center. I'm the heart of the CUNY Graduate Center. I want to welcome everybody to this uh, great event. Uh, the center is given over to the study of radical issues in politics. Uh, the theme of our seminar this year is uprisings. And this panel fits uh, extremely well with uh, what our work is about. Now, many people have uh, actually helped to put this event together, which we hope will be the beginnings of uh, uh, international collaboration between student movements uh, around uh, political questions. <clears throat> so, in addition to us here at the Center, uh, the Agile Project at CUNY, the Institute of Policy Studies, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at NYU, Radical History Review, the Hemispheric Institute of Performance and Politics at NYU, Yes Lab and Hemisphere Institute uh, all contributed to helping this event. So it's a, a cross university a collaboration, which is too infrequent here in New York City. So I'm very happy about that as well. Uh, this is a moment where obviously things are not all well in the global economy, where many people are suffering, where I think we have to move from a situation of thinking about another world thinking another world must be made. And I think that this particular moment is therefore very apt that two of the most active student movements uh, in the Americas, but that in Montreal, Quebec, and that in Chile are brought together with uh, the student activists here in New York City. And as I say, this is for me a great a pleasure and a privilege to be able to participate in this event. With that, I'd like to turn uh, the podium over to Connor Thomas Reed, who is a CUNY graduate organizer, and he's also the adjunct uh, project coordinator here in, in CUNY, who will introduce the members of the panel. Hi, how's everyone today? organize 
as the AUSS's first ever General Assemblies, which led to the only strike in its history and one of the only student strikes ever at McGill. Noam Titelman is the current president of the Universidad Católica Student Federation, F-A-U-C. You didn't get that. <laughs> he is also a spokesperson for the Confederation of Chilean Students, CONFECH, and is presently a student in commercial engineering and Spanish literature at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, Santiago. Camila Vallejo is vice president of the Universidad de Chile Student Federation, FECH. From 2010 to 2011, she was president of the FECH and has been a main spokesperson for the National Student Federation, the Confederation of Chilean Students, CONFECH. Vallejo is also a member of the Central Committee of the Chilean Communist Youth and a geography student at the Universidad de Chile in Santiago. Please join me in welcoming everyone here. cut 
budgets for programs and uh, departments. However, while it's succeeding in stopping these budget cuts and stopping these tuition increases, we see uh, that you know, every couple of years there has to be another struggle and another kind of you know, fight waged against the privatization of the, the college. Um, this was significant to um, us organizing, Students United organizing last year, because um, when we looked at the history of CUNY, we saw that there was resistance, that there always has been resistance, um, but that that resistance must also be developed and built in such a way that there really is a student movement that is constantly not only fighting to um, be able to win over open admissions again for everyone or decrease tuition, eventually abolish the Board of Trustees, but it's important that the movement is sustainable so that when we do win those fights, we can have those victories be more permanent. Um, last November, there were mass rallies and protests that were able to mobilize thousands of students against the Board of uh, Trustees. Now, City University of New York uh, now operates under the Board of Trustees, which is made up of 17 members who the uh, governor appoints uh, with no vote or any sort of participation of the students or faculty. Uh, the Board of Trustees is the one that makes decisions on tuition um, and curriculum. Um, the struggle that we are fighting against the Board of Trustees now is against Pathways, which is a legislation that kind of reduces the credits that students have to take in order to graduate. And, um, you know, as they like to put it, it simplifies the ability of a student to complete college, transfer from one uh, university to the other, from one campus to the other. But uh, we see it as an attack on programs that are not prioritized within our university. Um, we see it as a reduction of important departments like ethnic studies, women's studies, uh, gender studies. Um, we are also fighting against the rational tuition plan. And the rational tuition plan, which was passed in August 2011, uh, allows for CUNY and SUNY to be able to increase tuition $300 per semester for five years. And you know, while this, they uh, push for the rational tuition plan uh, as something that would give stability to the university financial crisis, uh, it, had, it has actually still proven to uh, make it really hard for students to be able to um, access higher education and finish their higher education careers, uh, their college careers. Um, last year in November, we held a student protest and they did mobilize thousands of students, but we didn't see ourselves closer to our goals of um, not only stopping the tuition increases and uh, our fight against pathways, but it did gain a lot of media. And we saw that there is an interest, there is um, a population of students who want to fight for the City University of New York to be more accessible. Um, the mobilizations of 1969, 1989, 1991, 1996, they were all uh, very militant, very um, focused on the escalation of uh, tactics in occupying spaces and protesting and closing off uh, streets and public access. But there was not a sustained uh, student movement that came out of that. Uh, so in building Students United for Free CUNY and working with groups now, uh, we see it as a necessity to really develop leadership, really develop student bases at each campus, um, you know, really not only teach about the, the, struggle, the history of the struggle in CUNY, but also you know the broader issues that are going on outside of the university. Um, and there's a quote. Uh, last semester we had uh, Sergio Fernandez, who is a student leader in the Colombian Student Union, and he came uh, to Baruch College at a student panel, much like this one. 
And he said something that really resonated um, within the audience that day. And he said that education is like a river, like the Amazon, shaping and molding our society. The shape of education determines the nature of the state. And the shape of the state determines the nature of education. This to me and to everyone in the audience that day really resonated because we do see that the university is much like a reflection of the state in which it is. Um, and our university in New York City really is a reflection of New York City as a whole and kind of the ongoing struggles that are going on within the university and outside the university in our community. Um, in building a student movement that is capable of broader radical change, we see that it's important to connect not only student issues, but the issues that the student faces outside of the university, the issues that are happening within all of their communities. New York City is a very diverse city, and our university reflects that very much. Uh, there are a lot of uh, students of color, um, students of different backgrounds, different religions, different faiths, uh, and our our movement or any sort of student movement or union really has to reflect that, it really has to reflect all of their interests. We see that, you know, we can't only deal with the issue of class, you know, the issue of the privatization of public higher education, you know, it's not only um, tuition increases and, and the, the economic effects that that has on students' lives, but it's also um, the way that our education system as a whole operates. Um, you know, the fact that, that public universities are being privatized and the ways in which that is being done and the people that it is excluding, ultimately. Um, we see that in, in, in building a, a sustainable student movement, um, we have to connect to all of those other issues. And that means, you know, as students, also connecting to the workers' rights to unionize. Um, you know, the fight against police repression inside the university and outside in our communities. Um, we must also deal with the issues of gender inequality, of racism, and overall criminalization of our communities. And uh, there's a couple of examples of that. Um, I really feel that our student movement must be anti-oppressive not only in its means, but in its masses. And by masses, we mean that the student movement really has to be massive. It has to appeal to uh, the general mass population of students who are really struggling to pay for their tuition. Um, you know, we see that there are a lot of, um, we need to build leadership among people of color and women specifically. We really need to evaluate you know, who are the people that are being kept out of the university the most, and you know, why it's important that we include them, that they are part of the leadership that we develop, their leadership within our movement. When we fight for a democratic, accessible university, we're not just fighting for the people that are enrolled right now, sitting in a classroom, but we are fighting for the people who can't afford to go to college, we're fighting for the people can't afford to keep going in their college careers, people that have to drop out. Um, in New York City, there's thousands of students who don't even make it to the, uh, to the to CUNY because of uh, criminalization within uh, the school system and the community. We see policies like you know, zero tolerance in high schools and stop and frisk in our community. And those are policies that are meant to target communities of color. And we don't, that's why we don't see a high enrollment in, in higher education, even in public higher education. And that's a problem. Um, there's also undocumented students, which is not often talked about. But you know, right now, uh, there is more than 2 million undocumented youth who could be going to college, uh, but can't uh, right at the moment work legally or access um, financial aid from the state for their college education. And this is a problem because uh, that's a large um, base of students. Um, and these people, they're mobilizing on their own. There's a big movement against stop and 
risks right now in New York City. You know, there's been uh, deaths um, almost weekly, if not daily, obviously. And um, there has been mobilization. And I, I think that Students United would really try to connect um, our students' struggles with also those struggles and how we can um, include, be inclusive of everyone. Um, the racism and discrimination that is seen in our communities, um, you know, with uh, criminalizing policies like stop and frisk, um, you know, the inability for undocumented youth to pursue their college careers. Uh, it, it's also a discrimination and racism that we see within CUNY. Uh, ethnic studies, grants, and programs that benefit students of color, single mothers, are often the first to go with legislation like Pathways. Um, the Board of Trustees, and even though the Board of Trustees actually rationalize um, their, their tuition increase and their Pathways policies, um, as soon after the big protest last November, actually uh, proposed to add an extra $15 million towards the budget of security guards uh, and police repression in campuses. Um, and I think that this speaks loudly of uh, kind of the logic that resonates within the Board of Trustees, which is an undemocratic board. As I mentioned before, it is appointed by the governor with no say on the students or the faculty. And this is, a, this is something that we really have to look at when they talk about raising tuition because of a, of a financial crisis, we have to remember that CUNY was free for more than 100 years. It was free during a depression, it was free during a recession, it was free during a credit crisis. Um, so there obviously is other interest in uh, implementing tuition and increasing tuition. It's obviously to keep certain populations of the students out of the university. And Students United for Community, um, our demands are to abolish the Board of Trustees and replace it with a democratic uh, board made up of students, faculty, and community leaders. Um, because we see that as the only solution to all of the um, implementations of these legislations. Um, we see that our fight doesn't end with stopping tuition hikes. Uh, it doesn't end with decreasing tuition hikes, hikes but it really, it really ends when to, CUNY is free of tuition and accessible for everyone. Um, in also noting that you know, we want a board of trustees that is democratic, you know, we say that it's supposed to be made up of students and faculty because the faculty is also in a, a struggle uh, against the board of trustees and in the administration. Um, right now, you know, the adjuncts are not able to negotiate really their working conditions. Um, you know, and in that we, you know, as students, we have to connect ourselves to the struggle of the workers. In, you know, with the adjuncts. Uh, with the faculty in assisting policies like pathways, um, you know, with cafeteria workers, with the janitors in their efforts to unionize within the uh, university facilities, um, we must also we must connect to that. Uh, Students United for CUNY is, is building towards a, a sustainable movement that can possibly fight for these causes. Uh, you know. We have been concentrating on, uh, since the protest last November, we have been concentrating on, you know, really building the student base at campuses. Uh, we see that as the only way in which we can build towards a broader, uh, larger student movement. We've been working to develop leadership, you know, organizing around campus, uh, local campus issues, you know, whether that's access to resources like printing, uh, like library hours, um, you know, like supporting faculty who are assisting pathway policies within their departments. Uh, we have been developing chapters or working with existing groups at campuses. Uh, and we see that as something important. Right now, the undocumented youth and their movement has been very inspirational because a lot of them are organized within college campuses. A lot of them have organizations in their, in their campuses. 
Um, and you know, it's important that we include them, that we work with them, that we are in solidarity with them because their struggle is our struggle. We operate under some sort of structure. We do have some elected positions uh, within Students United, and we also are part of New York Students Rising, which kind of connects CUNY to, uh, the SUNY, to SUNY, which is the State University of New York, and uh, in their campuses. And uh, you know, for us, the building of New York Students Rising really was uh, an important step because it, it meant that you know we weren't isolated in the in New York City and in our uh, CUNY campuses, but we were able to connect with students in Albany and Buffalo and um, other campuses and really see what they were doing and really realize that um, the struggle that we are fighting is the struggle that they're fighting. And uh, you know, through structures like New York Students Rising, we have been able to coordinate uh, statewide actions like November 17, which uh, I don't know if any of y'all here remember or heard about, but you know, was one of the most moving days of action in New York City. It really brought out thousands of students, um, and it really showed that that there is there is the student population to move and to kind of agitate a little bit, um, but. We also see that those structures are important because they facilitate communication between all campuses. They facilitate coordination within all campuses. Um, and it really allows us to kind of strengthen as a group um, and as a network of students uh, since the protests in November 21st, um, November 28th. Uh, there has been a lot of repression uh, within CUNY and within all colleges. Um, campuses were were open and now they are closed. Now there is a lot of policing, a lot of security uh, that people have to get through. Um, security, police, um, and the administrations at college campuses have begun to deny um, access to facilities, have begun to uh, really clamp down on events uh, that people are trying to organize. And um, you know, we see that, that these structures can kind of, kind of help us unify our message and see that this is something that's going on in all campuses. Um, I look forward to hearing what the structures and the other places are. occupations, state, national, international days of action, 
Um, so uh, the you know the the long view can also give us a sense of um, for anyone who uh, may proclaim that you know this uh, little scrappy movement called Occupy is dead. Um, I think that they either have a, a fairly morbid imagination, um, a short attention span, or really an impossible expectation uh, for something that's just beginning. Um, so looking just recently within the last year, a brief balance sheet of what we've experienced in New York City. Um, in two months, from September to November, there were hundreds of thousands of people who participated in a movement that very rapidly escalated around the city. Um, people very quickly sprung up assemblies and neighborhoods and campuses. People very quickly uh, transformed public space, Times Square, Union Square, uh, Washington Square, um, all of these different events that were happening uh, really around the city proliferated. Um, an entire city we saw um, very concretely, experientially was radicalized. And using these several years of education, uh, political education, training, experience, People who write in this room, people who were in the education movement, um, took a major lead in shaping the course of events and what happened over the last year. So what may have seemed like the slow, painstaking process of over the last several years suddenly was catalyzed into action whenever there were the forces that could be able to generate mass activity. Um, so building on uh, looking at this wider scope, I think that we can then turn around and then project much more audaciously into the future. Um, we need to really look past uh, the semester and academic year model of, of looking at our timelines. We need to figure out a five-year plan, a ten-year plan, for what the education movement can look like. Um, there are some different themes of the education movement that exists right now. Uh, CUNY Pathways, um, that um, uh, Denise had uh, explained um, in, in her portion of the talk. CUNY Pathways dumbing down our education um, uh, an immense reduction of faculty governance, the administration uh, basically sending threatening statements to departments that don't want to comply with pathways. Um, this is something that's a major theme that's happening in, in the New York City education movement right now. Another major theme is uh, the um, goal towards a student union, a New York City student union that can exist here. Um, and I'll speak about uh, more on that in just a bit. Um, free University has been a project that's been gaining a lot of potential. Um, different people who have been doing uh, work on uh, immigrant or documented immigrant rights around the dreamers. Um, stop, stop, and frisk. NYU, anti-gentrification, grad student organizing. Uh, the school to prison pipeline. The surveillance of Muslim students. LGBTQI equity. There are all of these different single issues that we're doing tremendous work around, but they really need to be coalesced into some kind of coordinated force. Um, many of us are doing work in all of these different groups and have our entire week set up where we go to one meeting uh, a night trying to figure out how to be involved in all of this. And what we're trying to do is to figure out how to really galvanize people in a much more actively coordinated way. We are definitely up against uh, a very serious situation. Um, education is in a profound crisis in New York City and in the United States altogether. Um, it's basically the last major social sphere um, that's being privatized that's in our generation right now. Um, there's a really excellent article that had come out called How the American University Was Killed in Five Easy Steps. Did anyone read that? So what it basically did was it laid out um, what things have been looking like over the last 30 years. How the American University was killed. Step one, defund public higher education. Step two, deprofessionalize and impoverish the professors. Step three, move in a managerial and administrative class who take over governance of the university. Tell me if any of this sounds familiar. <laughs> Step four, move in corporate culture and corporate money into public university systems. And step five, destroy student movements. So in sum, we have over the last 30 years and much more intensely concentrated over really the last decade, the last several years, um, we now see that adjuncts are currently 75% of all professors who teach in the United States. We see that administrators outnumber faculty on every campus across the country. Our school spaces, like the Graduate Center itself, they're rented out to the highest bidder. People who are connected to corporate money, connected to banks, connected to all of these different ridiculous ways that people are um, actively privatizing the globe. Um, students are forced to shackle ourselves with costly education, ongoing debt, and vulnerable work if we can get it. And if we try to resist, then we get arrested, we get pepper sprayed, we get intimidated, we get searched, we get followed around. 
So this is the situation that we're up against. And I want to deepen that a little bit more to talk about some of the different theoretical challenges that people in this generation of the New York City and uh, general US education movement have. Um, student movement politics in the United States have been historically formed over the last 30 years um, in a time period that was actually very, very difficult for organizations. Um, you had, uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, a uh, slow creation of conversations about what race, gender, sexuality, migration, ability means for social movements. In the 1970s and early 1980s, a huge backlash occurring on these social movements. Um, out of that, out of uh, the intense um, uh, pushback by government and business, you have the formation of identity politics, um, a politics of um, people trying to search for the most immediate kind of support that they can have between people who are like them. Um, and building on that throughout the 80s and the 1990s, you have the formation of what many people would agree is a more robust version of identity politics, a reformation of that um, being around an intersectional analysis. So I'm giving all of this just to give a sense that um, students, the education movement today, is largely formed out of that trajectory. It's formed out of intersectionality. It's formed out of um, really a lack of historical understanding of what organizations looked like, how organizations operated, what it looked like for people to build mass capacity in cities, in, in uh, campuses. So, um, you know, what we're trying to do is um, we're trying to push ourselves to become uh, a lot more dynamic and rigorous with the organizations that we exist in, in calling out the different times when there are these uh, things like racism or sexism or homophobia that can come up in our organizations. But at the same time, there's not enough work done that's then suggesting, well, what are the alternatives to these dominant ideologies existing in our organizations? It's not enough to just call out these different ideologies and say, okay, the work is done. I've done my critique, right? We need to be thinking, figuring out what are the different alternatives to these and how can we put them into place? So, um, as Denise had brought up, what we urgently need right now, right, is both combined intersectionality, anti-oppression analysis, as well as organized student power. We can also deepen our understanding of terms that have gained tons of traction over the last year, but everyone, I think, would, would agree that these shouldn't be accepted uncritically. These are different terms like decentralization, like autonomy, like consensus, like spontaneity. Um, when in difficult political periods, these concepts can be whittled down to husks of their former selves, right? You can have it where decentralization can become hyper-scatterization, right? We're decentralized, we're doing only different things at once. Um, autonomy can become a kind of non-cooperative individualism. Consensus can um, whittle down to a husk of its former self, become a go along to get along, or it can become a process paralysis that we see. And spontaneity, this can be construed as some kind of mythical event that explodes out of nowhere, but then it can leave huge organizational uncertainties whenever it disappears. So what happens in between these huge periods of escalation? What do we do with that? Something that um, Denise had started out with um, discussing and that I'm hoping that we can be uh, really getting a much clearer sense of throughout the afternoon is what, what we can argue is a main priority in New York City of building a student union Places like California, uh, we don't even have to look as far as Quebec, as Chile, as Puerto Rico, Brazil. Places like California are already charting out what a student union campaign would look like over the next two or three years. What would our student union campaign look like here in New York City? Um, people talk about the shared principles and actions of free education, demanding a free education, direct participatory democracy, political independence from parties, political independence from these kinds of reformist senses of how education can be changed, but only this much. Student and worker solidarity, national and international solidarity. So um, we can also look back to um, a little bit further back in our country's history whenever there were actually student unions. Um, in the 1930s, there was a national student union that held a major strike pledge against the war. Uh, the student union coalesced anti-racist, anti-fascist struggles that heated up throughout the decade. I think as uh, people who have been talking about student unionism in the United States and in New York City have rightly suggested as well, we can't necessarily graft onto New York City what student union models exist from elsewhere. So some different specific contexts for people here in, in New York. 
Um, we have a very interdisciplinary focus of our institutions. So elsewhere, people have organized on the department-based level, right? So what would it mean with an interdisciplinary focus to think outside of necessarily organizing on the department level? Does that make sense to us here in the United States, in, in New York? Would it make sense to organize along the lines of uh, different clubs that gather together around shared identities? Would it make sense to gather um, with centers, such as the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, the Center for the Study of Globalization and Social Change, the Hemispheric Institute, and so forth? Um, we can also look at different areas in the world where there hasn't been the sort of upward trajectory of struggle that people can base a lot of their current activities on. Um, there are places where only mass, only recently they've seen mass mobilization. Uh, places like Argentina, like in Spain, only within the last couple of decades there's been an upsurge of political activity, whereas for many decades before that there hadn't really been that much uh, in, so, in terms of social movement activity. I think also we can consider looking at together different flashpoints uh, where we can coalesce these kinds of student, faculty, worker uh, work that's, that can be done together. So something that I think was uh, done tremendously well in Chile and Quebec was the sense that um, this is not a student struggle, this is a social struggle. Um, and here in New York City, we can talk about education not being something that's just relegated to students, but that's something that people across the entire city, across the entire country, uh, need to get behind. Um, so some different suggestions for that. There's now a lot of work that's being done on uh, mobilizing people who are unemployed. Um, students, uh, currently, our position is we don't know that we will have a future. So many people who are in this room, when we graduate, we will be joining the ranks of the unemployed. So that means working with people who are already doing unemployed organizing right now. I know that Wednesday, November 7th, at Union Square, there's going to be a march of the unemployed in New York City. That's something that students can get behind. Um, also, March 2013, there's going to be, um, and I don't know if anyone has heard about this, the MTA has uh, decided to do another fair hike in March 2013, right? So this is a time when you have the majority of people who use the subway system in New York City, people of color, working people, who will all be experiencing that at the same time, right? And so what we can try and do is figure out what would a New York City-wide strategy look like to counteract this? What would student walkouts, student strikes, coupled with transit worker actions, coupled with uh, faculty actions in our university systems look like in trying to counteract uh, this fair right? I want to end uh, by throwing out some immediate next steps that people can get involved in. This upcoming Thursday, October 18th, is going to be an International Day of Action around education. Um, international Student Movement is having, uh, basically there are all of these different activities that are happening around the world. In New York City, students are going to be coming together to um, share experiences, also come up with strategizing ideas together at what will be an education festival summit kind of gathering. And that will be this Thursday from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. at the Brecht Forum. So I encourage every single person in this room to be actively involved in that. Sunday, October 28th, just a little bit after that, uh, people are going to be coming together to do a collective brainstorming on what student unionism would look like here in New York City. So this event, Envisioning Student Unionism, will be an opportunity for people to come together and talk about what student union examples have existed elsewhere that we can try out here. What would that two to three year campaign look like? Um, and we don't have a, a location for that just yet, um, but coming to the Thursday, October 18th event, you'll be able to find out more about that. November 14th through the 22nd, it's going to be an international week of action around education. I want to encourage everyone in this room to think about what you would like to see on your own campus, what you would like to see here in New York City to be actively participating in that. So, and just you know, to wrap up, I know that in CUNY at least, there are 500,000 students. There are about 50,000 faculty and staff members who are part of the union. There are millions of people in the CUNY family, right? People who went to CUNY, my mother went to Hunter College, people who may not be in CUNY now, but they went to CUNY beforehand. They know people who went to CUNY. So uh, somewhat like these different struggles around the Western Hemisphere, we can also look outside of our departments, outside of our campuses to see an entire city that can be mobilized to action to support the education movement. So I really want to encourage everyone, um, if you're not involved yet, to get involved. If you have been involved, take a deep breath and uh, consider the long haul in organizing. Um, but we really have the world to win. I think that we can dream big. And also, I'm very excited for us to learn a little bit more about how to do that more effectively from the
Thanks for coming up. Um, there's a 75% tuition fee increase announced in 2010, um, 
And that's sort of like what you know this movement is organized around. Um, for better or worse, it's like one like main issue that uh, initially started it, and that's like the focus of the entire movement. Um, there are small actions like uh, small occupations and protests, which is like in um, 11, and then November 10th, um, 2011, there was a large protest in Montreal. And but Montreal was um, geographically where um, everything happened. To the extent that people were referring to the strike movement as the Montreal movement. Um, so November 10th was like the large protest. Uh, it was about 30,000 students, which is the biggest thing we had you know, organized up until that point. It's really exciting. Um, and then we started like escalating our pressure tactics, and we started um, organizing strikes. Um, and uh, they started around like the second week of February. Um, and you know, there's once once the strikes happen, um, started, there were a lot of like other actions, like protests, or like disruptive actions. Um, March 22nd uh, was the first um, large protest. Um, on that day, there were uh, more than 300,000 students on strike at the secondary level. So. I told you there's about 250 to 400,000 students in all Quebec at the post secondary level. That's um, a huge majority. Um, so the strike sort of um, continued, these actions continued until, um, well, I mean, they continued past May 18th, was when uh, that protest of Lava Jane you heard earlier um, came to existence, uh, Bill 78. Um, it was it essentially a criminalized strike and Which in itself actually resulted in a lot of like organizing around that and actually um, um, strengthening the movement, um, at least for a period of time after that. Um, we had a really rough summer um, because uh, the, the strike had sort of um, been put on um, hold, right? The Bill 78 was essentially a lockout um, by the university mm -hmm. or by the government. Um, and then we had provincial elections the first week of September um, with the government, which then decided to temporarily um, withdraw the tuition fee increases, um, and we're looking and waiting to see what's going to come of that. So, um, one important, I guess, thing to um, mention is the organization of Passe. I mentioned already that they were um, sort of the only group that was, you know, the sort of backbone of the strike. Um, the way they organized themselves is really through, um, they really, uh, it, it's through direct democracy, so what that means is that decides on all kinds of issues with the strike, so that could be things like um, how they're going to the media, what the action plan is going to be, um, what the demands of the movements are going to be, and what are, um, how, whether or not we're going to accept the uh, government's uh, offers. And this Congress that makes all these uh, important strike-related uh, strike decisions um, had delegates from each of the student associations, each of the individual hundreds, thousands of students matters that their associations had already voted on at general assemblies. So there was nobody voting on behalf of others, um, the students that were on strike that took right away to say and vote. Um, 
people have this kind of memory there, and I think that allows the radical left to kind of expect more, to demand more, to uh, aim a little higher in terms of what they expect of their social movements, and I think that, that that's something that makes a big difference. Um, the main thing that I do want to talk a bit about, though, is um, I think the biggest difference structurally, which is the way that the student movement itself is understood. Um, how it should be structured, why it does the things it does, and I think that kind of the most central aspect of this, and it's, it's very self-consciously kind of based on um, a bit of a legacy with the, the French student movement coming out of uh, May 1968. I mean, it's the basic idea is that students are intellectual workers, and it's to see students as a group as having this particular relationship to capital, to uh, means production, to sort of social reproduction as a whole, and aside from having this idea, that has specific consequences. Um, and I think one of the most important consequences is if you don't just see students as sort of a social strata that just kind of exists and they have these characteristics and these demographic characteristics, you have to look at, you, you actually look at students as a group and say, well, students are in universities. And universities aren't kind of an incidental cultural activity. Universities, like, fulfill major social functions. Um, they fulfill this kind of function of reproducing leaders and business people and politicians and lawyers, but they also kind of increasingly, of course, uh, in the last few decades since the, since the Second World War, they reproduce workers. And those are people who do important things for capital. And the, the idea is, since we're actually workers, since we actually provide a service to capitalists, since they actually need us to do the, the things that we do as students, they're, like, the, the state will not be okay, business will not be okay if we just shut down the universities just shut down the colleges. And they've been right over and over again, I think Ramak mentioned, that there have been now, this is the eighth general strike in Quebec, all of which have won basically their, their main demands. And it's it's a big deal in a movement that to, to win all of your demands every time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and all these are their problems, and, and we can talk a bit about later about sort of what we're trying to deal with now and all the things that are I think a lot of people on the rise of left would have a huge problem with Jamie saying that we've won most of our demands. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. And, and, and of course, and I think that, that, that is partly related to the fact that uh, people, again, are demanding a lot. People do ask a lot. And I, I think that um, the, the basic point is this, which is the, the strategy has always worked. I think that the totality of the demands achieved is a different question, but the strategy has always worked. Um, when you actually shut down your schools, eventually they will be more solicited to you. Um, and I think that's kind of the most important thing that I want to say about that. <laughs> Thank you. 
your hand at some, sorry, I'm jumping from all over the place, but at the, through our state associations, we usually at departmental levels. Um, so, for instance, I'm in the Bowman Study Student Association, it's my association, um, and we have a general assembly, we have about 200 students, um, and we want as many people there at that general assembly, not just for like a cool, like, rapid friends, but everyone there, so that it's actually representative, so that students actually feel like the decisions of the general assembly are legitimate. Um, and that's something we've seen a lot, right? Like the media, um, especially the uh, mainstream media, when they do actually decide that they're going to cover our movement, um, they'll do everything they can to delegitimize like, the process and what it actually is. But what's really important is that people, act, um, people that are active in the movement feel that it's legitimate, feel that, you know, that this is representative of also what they're going through, what, you know, what they want. And so it's really important for general assemblies to actually be open to the entire um, like student body. So the process of that general assembly so you can as well. Um, um, another thing that we had an issue with, I think, at the speaking on universities is just the tickets. For some reason, we just like we didn't think that ticketing classrooms was really necessary. Um, I mean, it's, it's not a huge, uh, huge important point, but we just thought that we could do things differently, that we could like, talk to people. Um, but really, that's, um, that came to be really ineffective, and it, it, like, it resulted in people actually getting like, Things. 
and that, that had a lot to do with you know the ecological sort of outflowing of, of that strike, and it was a lot more difficult to do um, this time around because there were a lot of lockouts um, where colleges were just boarded up for three months. Um, but I, I think that it's it's not just that that's behind something that I see as kind of a, a limitation. And the basic idea is this: um, the student movement in Quebec doesn't really criticize that much the role the universities play in society. Um, I think everyone is capable of recognizing that uh, universities can, can provide a valuable social service. They, they clearly have enabled uh, lots of people to educate themselves, educate their communities, educate each other, and do a lot of really powerful things with that. I mean, women's studies programs, and we both women's studies students, um, have this really amazing capacity to kind of use these institutional resources um, to serve interests that are not necessarily the state's interests or the whatever private owner's interests. I mean, those sorts of things are really exciting, but I think there's kind of this other aspect of universities where, of course, um, that's not what it is. It's about making weapons, or it's about training politicians, or it's about doing all kinds of other things that um, we kind of tolerate in our institutions, and, and, and it does get challenged, but I think um, one of the things that we really do have a kind of power over as students is actually interrupting that process, actually kind of we have a specific ability of, because of where we live our lives, because of our relationship to our, our campuses, to actually say, like, we're not going to allow this sort of thing to go on. Um, we could actually say, you know, we don't want public money uh, to be used to, uh, you know, train kids to be union busters in management faculties. I mean, we could do that. We could, we could raise those sorts of demands with our universities, and that's something that was pretty limited. Um, in fact, I think something else that you kind of saw in, there, there's a popular reaction to the strike, and a lot of what was behind that was um, for working class people, uh, the, the, the education system in Quebec is very white, um, and it's, it's, it's significant if compared to the society as a well, whole, especially in Montreal. Uh, there was this kind of reaction from a lot of different communities that kind of said, like, I don't want to pay for you to become a doctor. I don't want to pay for you to become a uh, celebrity intellectual. Like I'm I work hard, I pay my taxes, I didn't get to go to university, and my kids aren't gonna get to go to university. And I don't really want to pay for you to run my life. And I think that there there is a lot of rhetoric that comes out of student movements about like uh, creating leaders and about um, creating this kind of political caste, however enlightened or benevolent, who is just kind of trying to run society. And I think we really need to challenge that if we want our movements to be meaningful to people who don't have access to that kind of privilege. Um, and I think partly that means um, opening up the university. I think that partly means extending the kind of program you bring into the university. And I think um, that also means challenging what actually gets taught, what, what the point of education is. Um, but I think I just think it's really important to acknowledge that universities are kind of problematic institutions, contradictory uh, institutions, and we can't just um, kind of rely on this fantasy of a social democratic university. That I, I, I do get the feeling is, is a bit more of a fantasy in Quebec than it, than it is here. I mean, one thing that is kind of notable in Quebec, I was speaking to uh, someone about with this, um, in, in Quebec you really do have kind of the future political class in the same classrooms as people who are going to go just work at Starbucks for the rest of their life. And like, the, the universities are a little bit less divided. I mean, there, there are better universities, but I, I think it, it's, it's a weird situation to work in that environment than maybe the situation you'll have in New York where you maybe have a bit more in common with your classmates. And, and those sorts of things make differences. But I think regardless, it, it's important for all of us, depending on where we're working and what's going on in our schools, to actually look at like what is going on here what effects does this have on society? Um, what kind of goal does it give me? And like, how do we kind of change that? So another one of the things that um, the student movement in Quebec will have to continue to um, have to work on in the future is around the issues of building a more inclusive student movement. Um, and these are issues that we're going to touch upon in, um, in the context of Europe as well. So um, I don't like necessarily think that um, the Quebec student like movement as a whole was any more like um, like discriminatory than like the Quebec society in general or you know other student uh, like other social movements. Although maybe that's not um, that, that that shouldn't be our like goal, right? To like <laughs> be just as racist as the rest of society. Like, um, uh, and there were a lot of um, significant efforts made to make the movement more inclusive and. Um, 
to sort of like approach that on various different issues. Um, and then those, those, you know, do like merit some sort of like recognition. Um, so there was, um, like I see itself as an uh, explicitly feminist organization. Um, there were a lot of uh, like protests and like um, just like organization like actions, events around um, various different issues. So there's a whole um, mining rock going with the fact that it's not, you know, <laughs> There's a whole other topic, but it's essentially um, you know, mining on indigenous, uh, indigenous land, and that was something that was important in the social movement to an extent. Um, but it was also something that came to this, that we came to the realization that it, you know, it, tuition was a really sort of like main focus issue, and that other issues were sort of like something for free, and they were um, not uh, incorporated as much as they could have, and they don't live like single issue lives. And really need to work on um, really sort of like dealing with like the intersectionality of like our like identities and, and our struggles. Um, and that's something that we'll have to do. And that's something that's a conversation that's being had because that's um, a lot right now and that needs something that needs to be continued. Now, 
the story was implemented in my country during a very special period, during a dictatorship, during the ages. And this is not the way that education in my country was run for a, a very long time. What this system did uh, was to uh, deliver a promise of uh, better education and through that better education, a better life, uh, more opportunities for everyone and even maybe a more united, closer, um, fraternal society. And then something happened. We saw several riots, the biggest one of them all last year. Uh, over a million people on the streets, more than six months of student strike. Uh, many students uh, in the high school lost uh, their academic year. Um, university uh, students and professors not working for six, seven, eight months. So unless you think madness is a common disease. There is something that wasn't working. Why were so many people willing, willingly losing their uh, academic possibilities? Especially because there is one part of the story that seems to have worked. Uh, never before have there been so many university students in Chile. About eight of every ten students are first generation university students. So why was this is not working for everyone. And uh, I think there are, there are many ways to, to see this problem, but um, we can give one opinion, we can give another opinion, but I think usually numbers don't lie. And uh, the first number uh, that I think is interesting is that in Chile about 8% of cost of higher education comes or is paid by families from their pockets. It's the highest rate in the OECD. I don't know what's it is. Close enough. Uh, it's one of the highest in the world, actually. I think it's almost, I think it's about the same as South Korea, and those are the two highest in the world. So basically, who is paying for this is the families. Secondly, 42% of students in the private sector um, have negative, uh, a negative profit from their educational investment. What does that mean? That they come out poorer than what they were when they started studying. And there are many reasons for this. But perhaps one of the most interesting things about higher education in Chile is that uh, Unlike most systems in the world, the rich go to public educational system and the poor are left to the private system education. Now, this is um, unusual because this happens in a large scale, although I know that uh, to a smaller scale it happens in many places. For example, uh, we use a lot as an example of this Phoenix University. It's a university that gives titles through the internet. Um, well, this sort of universities, which are of doubtful quality at least, and uh, that basically attend 
education. But to be honest, the struggle to overcome inequality, uh, which is an example, too, I don't know if it can translate into America, but uh, football game in the summer, game lasts 90 minutes. We say that the further this football soccer game to overcome inequality, 89 of the 90 minutes are played uh, during uh, middle and, and during the first years of school and not in the higher school. Higher school, higher uh, education is only the last minute of this soccer game. So if you want to uh, overcome inequality, most of the struggle will be in primary education. And in the primary education, we have a more common Uh, uh, 
solution to their problems, and the state will only intervene when they are not achieving uh, the optimum, uh, optimum result. Uh, this was, on the one hand, a very strong principle in the conservative uh, forces, and on the other hand, a very strong school of thought that uh, saw in the Chilean dictatorship the opportunity to have a little experiment. found themselves very comfortable with this other subsidiary idea. Uh, and therefore, in this story I was telling you before, this idea that the state should basically only intervene by subsidizing the demand through voucher system and through competition, perfect information, and this uh, idea that if, uh, if there, even if there could be, there could exist a uh, university or a school that didn't work properly, it will perish in time because of perfect competition and students would migrate from the bad schools into the good schools and from the bad universities into the good universities and so on. And the idea was that there was no necessity of central or state in, uh, intervention of any sort, much like in the bread market. There's a, this famous quote that uh, Adam Smith uh, quoted, it's not because of the goodwill of the baker that he wakes up every morning and does the bread. It's because of his uh, own personal selfish uh, wants. And that this invisible hand will somehow result in a, a social uh, optimum. Well, what we found out that this social hand can turn into a fist and hit you in the face pretty easily. <laughs> And this is what was happening in, in our country. We have the most segregated educational system in the world. We have the most expensive adjusted by income uh, university fees in the world. We have this uh, fast food universities uh, growing in an incredible speed. And at the same time, we saw that inequality in our country remained the same. So, uh, when we saw this complicated scenario, uh, which I, I want to insist is very particular to children's reality. I know that there is some similarity perhaps with other realities, but what we saw in Chile was a deliberate experiment done in the 80s. Uh, some of it has been uh, uh, imitated later on, even by the states, uh, United States. I know that right now, for example, there's a discussion about um, Medicare and the voucher system and all the same. Well, the, we didn't have the discussion, we, we just involved the <laughs> <laughs> So it's very interesting to see what our government's answer is. Uh, but in Chile, we have the same system imposed in education, in health, in uh, social prevention, in uh, everything you, you can imagine. So it was very easy for us to see that this uh, critique of this, uh, this negative situation that we saw in education was a problem much larger than only students. So in 2011, something uh, different happened. In, in our country, I think in most countries in the world, even though maybe it's not as known as it should be, there is a long history of student movements and uh, social movements in general. Um, and uh, the student movement in, in Chile was perhaps at a few um, different elements that explained why it grow so large. During the dictatorship, almost all of all of unions um, and other organizations, neighborhood organizations, were dismantled. And the only organization that stood relatively strong, although not well, 
last year, is that uh, the government, whenever it felt that the movement was becoming too large, perhaps too dangerous, the way it attacked the movement, it, it said this movement is becoming too political. <laughs> something political is something bad, obviously. And uh, I think that what was uh, different in this movement is that instead of saying, no, this is not a political movement, uh, uh, I don't know, this is a movement of everyone. Yes, this is a large movement. This is a movement of a uh, large majority of our country. According to surveys, it, even, it, it represented almost 90% of the country. But it's exactly because of that, it was a deeply political movement. Because to be political, go beyond the small struggles, uh, sector real struggles, and start in addressing the structural issues. And I believe that, uh, well, I'm sorry, Jane, Jane, but I think that when one attacks the structural issues, uh, one never feels completely victorious after none of the struggles. And that is natural, that is good, that means that there is reason to I think that also that's what differentiates, differentiates sorry, that word is a bit hard. <laughs> uh, a beautiful, noble, naive movement, but a beautiful, noble, effective movement. When we only, I think there is, uh, there is a obvious temptation as young as a youth to stay with beautiful ideas, but not to soil our hands with, uh, with reality and to um, get our hands dirty with reality sometimes means, uh, for example, to be very political. And for example, the big thing that we are uh, asking ourselves right now as a movement is what is going to be our uh, relation to the upcoming presidential elections, so on and so on. And I think that that is also a part, an uh, important part. Um, just to finish, uh, I hope we can discuss more during the questions. I believe that there are some things that unite all struggles around the world for a more just and more uh, equal society. But I also believe that it is important that when we discuss these issues that we recognize the differences between each reality. I do not believe that there is the same reality in Chile, in Colombia, in Canada, in the States, in Europe, in the Middle East. I think there are different realities that may have some common ground, but we should always remember that uh, our history defines uh, the moment that we are living right now and we may help each other through um, companionship, through uh, telling our stories, this, this long sh story that is told in a short way. And as long as we recognize each other's struggle as an equally important but different struggle, I believe that there is much to learn in the spaces such as this. Thank you.
A ver, yo quiero partir señalando algo eh, que alcancé a entender de la exposición anterior y que tiene eh, también relación con cómo se vivió la situación en Chile, el movimiento estudiantil y el movimiento social por la educación, y que dice relación con que esto no fue algo espontáneo, sino que fue la síntesis de un proceso histórico. I would like to uh, pick up on something that was brought up in uh, the previous, uh, one of the previous presentations uh, that has also uh, much to do with uh, the case of the movement for education in Chile, and that is that the movement uh, is uh, the product uh, that didn't, didn't just happen spontaneously, but it's the product of a social historical process. Y esto es siempre ha sido importante para nosotros señalarlo eh, hacia otros países porque desde el discurso oficial de los medios en Chile, por lo menos se trata siempre de quitarle el, como el contexto histórico del movimiento social y tratar de situarlo en una situación como de espontaneidad, sin relación con la historia de nuestro pasado. And uh, we always find it important to point this out, uh, particularly since the media is always uh, attempting to really take the historical context uh, away and presenting the social movement as something more that is more spontaneous uh, rather than something that's historical. <coughs> bueno, nosotros tenemos un, una historia que por lo menos, o sea, una historia de movimiento de la educación que al menos parte de la década del 60, del 68, con la reforma del 68, quizá muchos acá que tienen o son exiliados en Chile, o familiares de exiliados podrán conocer el rol que jugaron nuestros padres en ese proceso y que fue básicamente eh, impulsado por el ideario de que la educación jugara un rol de transformación social en el contexto también del proceso de democratización del país con la Unión Popular. Um, the history of the student movement goes back quite a long way and certainly uh, I would say to 1968 and the student reform movement uh, that emerged there at that moment. Uh, many people, there might be people here who maybe are exiles or are the, the children of exiles who will know and remember uh, the important role that uh, our parents uh, played in that movement. And that, that movement was uh, motivated uh, by the understanding of education as a key uh, piece transformation of society and particularly in that in the context of the popular unity government. Proceso que eh, ciertamente logró eh, ser eh, en algún sentido efectivo y por lo mismo fue interrumpido como lo fue la UP con eh, la dictadura militar. El proceso de democratización de la institución educativa fue interrumpido violentamente y después de eso el movimiento eh, por lo menos en la década de los 90, se centró básicamente en la resistencia. Lo, no hablo lo mencionaba, las federaciones estudiantiles, muchas de ellas fueron eh, pasadas a la ilegalidad y el movimiento estudiantil tuvo que volver a levantar el caso emblemático de la fecha en la, en la Universidad de Chile. And so this uh, movement for transformation uh, uh, in the context of the popular unity was relatively successful and for that very reason uh, it was interrupted violently interrupted uh, this, uh, the, the democratization of institutions that was underway under that process uh, was stopped uh, through the military coup. Um, and what happened in following, as non uh, as mentioned, was that in the 1980s, the federations that sort of existed, uh, but really were dedicated to resistance and had to be sort of uh, brought kind of back, re-articulated re in, in the context of Después el movimiento tuvo eh, muchas dificultades y pasó una etapa de caimiento en cuanto a la apuesta política y se centró básicamente en reivindicaciones de carácter económico. Eso eh, fue el principal contenido de, por ejemplo, las movilizaciones del 2005. Eh, después de eso el movimiento logró retomar eh, las demandas de carácter más estructural con lo que se llamó la Revolución Pingüina en 2006. ¿Podría explicar un poco eso? Y posteriormente recuperamos la capacidad de articulación con otras organizaciones del mundo de la educación en 2009 a través de un Congreso Nacional de Educación. So, uh, coming out of, of this, this moment where the movement was mainly dedicated towards resistance, once uh, the, uh, formal democracy returned, uh, the student federations were sort of re-articulated and, but they dedicated their demand to the movement at first in the sort of 2000s to uh, economic, uh, purely economic demands. Um, that grew uh, in 
2006, those demands began to move towards a more structural churn with what's known as the Revolución Pinguina. Uh, pinguinos refer to penguins, and it's the secondary students because they wear the uniforms that are sort of navy blue and, and white. And that movement began a, 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 a more of a turn towards structural uh, demands. And then we moved forward to a Congress uh, of all educators in 2009, where that process continued. Sí, hay tres que resultó ese proceso. En 2006, dado que los estudiantes secundarios logran tocar eh, los ejes estructurantes del modelo educacional, erradicamos la constitución política de Pinochet. Eh, después, en 2009, la capacidad de generar lazos con otras organizaciones del mundo de la educación es sin pasar ya de lo gremial en la organización a una cuestión más multisectorial y política. Y en 2010, ante el terremoto eh, que vivió Chile, que fue catástrofe bastante importante, fuimos los estudiantes los que demostramos nuestra capacidad de organización al ser incluso los mejores evaluados en la capacidad inmediata de respuesta ante los afectados. Entonces esos tres elementos nos permitieron conjugar ciertos eh, aspectos para salir a la calle en 2011 con demandas de fondos, con capacidad de articulación y con capacidad de organización en, nuestro propio, en nuestras propias instituciones. So there are three key dates or landmarks uh, that sort of lead to the eruption of the movement in 2011. These are then the 2006, where the student uh, protests turn towards a more structural critique. It's begin to make more structural demands. Uh, that, that's the first time that the, 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 the changing of the constitution is brought up by the student movement. Uh, in 2009, uh, where we began to build uh, closer ties with other actors in the educational sphere, as well as actors beyond it, so that it allowed us a perspective and a capacity that was multi-sectoral, if you will. And then in 2010, uh, which was the date of the earthquake in Chile, which was an enormous catastrophe and a very strong uh, event, and there uh, students uh, were evaluated as the first uh, in their capacity to respond to the victims and turn around and have the kinds of organizations that responded to this national emergency. So it was these three sort of dates and set of elements that in 2011 allows us to uh, go into the street with a set of structural articulated demands and with the organizational and mobilizational capacity that we have. Bueno, esos son elementos que permiten entender como la maduración orgánica y política del movimiento por la educación. Ahora, la maduración política se da eh, de alguna otra forma, y lo explicaba Noam, por eh, comprender que la crisis eh, de nuestro modelo educativo, segregado, de mala calidad, excluyente, que lo conduce a fines de lucro más que el proyecto educativo, eh, tiene que ver con comprender que nuestro modelo está sobre ideologizado. So uh, th these elements are then what allow us for a, a maturation of the organization and the political sort of capacities of the movement. And one of these, uh, it, it, in, in particular, the, the, the sort of political maturation is an understanding of something that was brought up by Noam um, that our educational model, as uh, uh, Noam described it, is overly ideologized. Incluso. No lo decíamos solo nosotros, los estudiantes, sino que lo decía la misma OCDE, eh, que la educación chilena estaba influenciada por una ideología que le daba una importancia eh, inapropiada ¿cierto? A, al mercado eh, y las reglas del mercado en el fondo en lo que es los procesos de enseñanza y aprendizaje. Es más, la OCDE dice, como dice Noam, eh, que la educación en Chile está conscientemente estructurada por clases sociales. Es decir, que no es, el resultado de esta crisis no es algo casual, sino que es algo premeditado, es ideológico. And um, it's not just the student movement that, that uh, sort of understands the, the crisis as part as the result of a model that's over ideologized. The OECD and other uh, international organizations also uh, clearly state that the Chilean model is, is, is profound, is, is influenced ideologically uh, in ways that are excessive and inappropriate. Uh, 
um, and with its reliance on the market and the stories that Noam uh, was, uh, was telling, uh, but also uh, affirming uh, that the crisis is no surprise because it was indeed in this over-ideologized context created to be this way. In other words, created to produce these very outcomes. Por lo general, he sabido que la educación o los sistemas educativos en las distintas partes del mundo pueden funcionar en, o como herramientas de transformación de un determinado orden social o como herramientas de reproducción de determinado orden social o modelo de desarrollo. En el caso chileno, eh, el modelo mercantil privatizado en la educación funciona como una herramienta de reproducción del modelo de desarrollo neoliberal impuesto eh, durante la dictadura. Por algo, eh, la contrarreforma que se hace en educación es justamente un día antes que se, va, que se cae la dictadura militar. Entonces era como para agarrar un poco ese modelo a partir de la educación. So, as I understand it, uh, educational models remain either sort of transform society, social structures, or actually serve to reproduce them. And the Chilean case is clearly one in which the educational model, with its reliance on Marx and all these forms, uh, is clearly intended to reproduce uh, the model of society, the inequalities existing in society. Uh, this is, you know, further corroborated by the fact that the final educational uh, uh, sort of transfer, uh, legislation that happens, it happened on the, very, on the day before the dictatorship uh, left power. So in other words, put in place very much to cement and reproduce what they had put in place. Y está pensado para la reproducción del modelo neoliberal en dos aspectos al menos. Uno tiene que ver con la reproducción del orden socioeconómico de la desigualdad socioeconómica, eh, de producir en fondo eh, también eh, las fuerzas económicas para la reproducción del modelo a través de mano de obra barata, mano de obra cualificada o eh, económica. Eh, y por otro lado, la reproducción eh, ideológica que permita eh, hacer sostenible el ordenamiento político de nuestro país. And so uh, the, the, the Chilean model then is, is structured very explicitly to re reproduce the neoliberal economic map model that was imposed in the, under the dictatorship uh, in two uh, specific ways. One is a re reproduction of the socioeconomic order uh, and the structure of inequality uh, that um, are sort of necessary for this system to continue to produce the kinds of, uh, sort of labor, the segmentation of labor in all these other uh, areas. And the other is uh, the ideological reproduction uh, of the system that will allow for the political continuation uh, of the system to remain in place. Lo primero se refleja en la segmentación socioeducativa que está diseñada así, es decir, allá habían durante la dictadura militar eh, ideólogos que decían que eh, la calidad de la educación iba a estar otorgada según la capacidad o el esfuerzo económico que pusiera la familia, por tanto condenada a la segmentación, inevitablemente. Eh, eso tanto en la educación escolar, que está pobre en segmentos medio ricos, como en la educación superior, que está dividida también por castas sociales, Y, eh, por otro lado, los elementos ideológicos. En Chile, la juventud no conoce cómo se elige el presidente de la República, en un 70 y tantos por ciento, eh, y no conoce cómo se eligen los parlamentarios. Es decir, no tiene la educación cívica. La educación cívica se eliminó en, durante los 80. Creo que no... No, perdón, en 74, 75 se eliminó la educación cívica, inmediatamente. Es decir, que permitían finalmente instaurar una educación apática, acrítica y formar autómatas que no se cuestionaran nuestro sistema político en nuestra realidad. So, uh, these two uh, sort of modes of reproduction of the neoliberal system that I, I mentioned earlier sort of break down into sort of one. Uh, the creation of this very, very segmented educational system so that the kind of socio-educational panorama 
uh, of, of highly segmented sort of groups uh, that then get reproduced. And there were ideologues, certainly during the dictatorship, that explicitly spoke about the quality and level of education being tied to either the amount of effort or wealth that families would invest in it, thereby creating these enormous and very rigid sort of system of, of sorts of educational system. And the second one is on the ideological level, uh, where it is the case uh, that over 70% of Chilean students are not aware uh, or do not know explicitly how the president of the republic is elected, how uh, people are elected for Congress. In other words, there's an absolute absence of any civic education. Uh, civics was eliminated from the system very early on in the dictatorship in 1974. And their, uh, their mission there was to create an educational system uh, and with a type of education that was completely apathetic, acritical, and one that would generate acritical um, automatons. Then, así que el proceso de movilización del 2011 fue una gran escuela. Hay mucho incluso de nosotros, los dirigentes, aprendimos cómo funcionaba el Parlamento internamente. And so the, the movement in 2011 was an enormous school because many of us leaders even actually learned how Congress functions. Una gran escuela. Eh, pero además de eso, como eh, tanto el sistema privado, que es mayoritario, como el público, está hegemonizado por el mercado, ya, o sea, independiente de la propiedad, eh, la mayoría de las áreas de, cono de conocimiento que son críticas o que son humanistas o artísticas han ido desapareciendo porque no son rentables en el mercado. Entonces hay un progresivo, una progresiva disminución de esas carreras y hoy día con este gobierno de derecha que van a disminuir mucho más. Porque, bueno, no voy a entrar en detalle, pero van a disminuir mucho más. Entonces tenemos un grave problema. En Chile no existe, por ejemplo, la economía política. Existe solamente... Eh, la carrera de negocio ¿cierto? en la Universidad de Chile, en la Universidad Pública, supuestamente. Eh, y la filosofía, las artes, las humanidades, cada vez están más desplazadas del currículum. And so, both in the private system, that's the, the, the largest piece, but in the public system, um, uh, education and curricula are absolutely tied to the market and therefore property. Uh, and so, uh, what ends up uh, happening? is that uh, uh, fields, departments, uh, majors uh, that would tend to produce uh, more kind of critical students both at, at, at all levels are diminishing uh, the programs in the arts and various other kinds of fields are, are, are diminishing. Um, and with this uh, right-wing government, they're going, they're going to diminish much more. So for example, at a public university like the University of Chile, there is no field or department of political economy, uh, there is a business school. Wow. Bueno, y lo otro es que nosotros hemos dicho que de alguna otra forma en Chile ha existido como cierta preferencia no revelada o no eh, transparentada por ir haciendo eh, que el sistema público se reduzca a su mínima expresión que eso es lo que ha pasado en la realidad, pero hay una intencionalidad política detrás. Y, y por eso es que en Chile todas las reformas que se hicieron desde la dictadura en adelante no solo le abrieron el camino a la privatización de la educación y, y entender la educación como un bien de consumo, un bien transal de mercado, por tanto un negocio, sino que se enfocaron particularmente a destruir la educación pública porque era considerada como la plaza del enemigo interno donde se formaba pensamiento crítico, donde se formaban herramientas a través de profesionales y técnicos con visión política de la realidad que estuvieran dispuestos a transformar la realidad. Y eso eh, fue un, sigue siendo un objetivo político no declarado, pero que se traduce en las consecuentes reformas eh, de carácter mercantil en, en nuestra educación. Um, and characteristic of the system and one which is not made explicit or not really revealed its, uh, its, its, its intent and preference for diminishing the public system into its least or its minimum possible expression. So both during the dictatorship and then from 1990 on, uh, onwards, uh, it's not merely then that, uh, that, that, that things become privatized and, and everything is handed over to the market or you know, a, a, allowed to operate within that domain, but also kind of secretly in the ideological piece of it is that 
at the same time, you sort of diminish and dismantle uh, uh, the public system very aggressively uh, because it is in the public system at the level of the universities where, uh, which is, is where the, the, the internal enemy is trained. And that would be the place then that's ideologically feared that might create the professionals and the technical workers who would have a vocation to uh, transform society. Uh, and it is therefore a reason to dismantle it or minimize it. Como todas estas reformas que se han hecho son, sin lugar a dudas, violentas y poco aceptables para la ciudadanía en general, sobre todo antes de la dictadura cuando había un nivel de conciencia mayor. Lo que se tuvo que hacer, además de privatizar el sistema, quitar los recursos a las instituciones públicas, tuvo que instaurarse estructuras antidemocráticas en instituciones y la prohibición de organización, sobre todo en el mundo privado, que es mayoritario. Hoy día en Chile eh, hay un decreto que es delegado de la dictadura militar que todavía está vigente, que prohíbe que las organizaciones, primero, que se organicen, estudiantes, trabajadores, pero que además participen en los gobiernos universitarios. Entonces eso se traduce finalmente en que en, haya persecuciones políticas dentro del establecimiento y no se cuenten con las herramientas de empoderamiento muchas veces de las comunidades, eh, sobre todo en el mundo privado, para decir basta eh, con este abuso, basta con la estafa, ba basta con el lucro en las universidades, centros de formación técnica, en institutos profesionales del mundo privado. And so, uh, the, these reforms were, were certainly violent and certainly uh, not very acceptable, especially considering the levels of consciousness that existed in the country uh, before the military coup. Um, but in order to uh, guarantee that these structures would remain in place, not only were all of the things I've mentioned put in place, but they also uh, found the need to sort of to, to limit or prohibit the right of organization, uh, particularly in private establishments, which are the majority, as we said before. So there is a law still on the books from the days of the dictatorship that prohibits the organizations of students and workers and the unionization of workers uh, in, in uh, private educational institutions uh, and therefore creating conditions uh, in which people are persecuted and or any sorts of opinions uh, against uh, profit and education and all the other sort of sets of issues. Um, there are all, all kinds of obstacles uh, for those to be expressed. Bueno, y ante esa situación que nosotros eh, comprendimos desde el carácter ideológico de nuestro sistema, lo cual nos parecía muy divertido porque se nos acusaba a nosotros de los sobre ideologizados cuando exigíamos un derecho básico. Eh, salimos también con propuestas, porque no nos no servía de nada simplemente decir que esto estaba mal, sino que cómo enfrentamos esta situación. Y para eso nosotros nos enfocamos principalmente en el elemento del cambio de paradigma que tenía que tener el modelo educacional en Chile. Uh, in, in the face of the situation uh, of this uh, overly ideologized character of the, system, the educational system in Chile, and it's sort of ironic that we are the ones that are generally accused of being too ideological, we couldn't only speak out and, and, and name what the problems were, but we also had to come forth uh, with concrete proposals. And uh, what animated these concrete proposals was demanding a, a paradigm shift on the part of the government. Entonces, ese cambio de paradigma efectivamente tiene como principal objetivo que la educación es una herramienta de transformación social, ¿cierto? No de reproducción del actual modelo, que es un modelo de crecimiento empobrecedor que profundiza las desigualdades. Y eso implica, en, primero, evidentemente, la recuperación del derecho a la educación, la recuperación de la educación pública como un derecho universal. Eh, y por otro lado, la disolución de la hegemonía del mercado en el sistema educativo. Eh, eso implica también hacer reformas en el sistema privado. Nosotros en Chile, dada la situación de extrema privatización, es decir, que hay, la mayoría de los estudiantes están en el sistema privado, no podíamos desconocer esa realidad. Por tanto, si nos preocupamos de todos los estudiantes de Chile o de todos los profesores, teníamos que establecer regulaciones también en el sistema privado. So, um, 
Uh, this paradigm shift involved uh, our belief uh, uh, that uh, education is a tool uh, to transform a society, uh, that uh, much more than to merely reproduce it. And as a result of that, uh, we made uh, specific demands about uh, the recuperation of the right to education, uh, the recuperation of, of public education, uh, the disillusion, uh, dissolution of the hegemony of, of the market in uh, the educational system. Um, and also, uh, we had to pay attention to the needs of students in the private uh, system. Um, you know, Chile is a country that suffers from extreme uh, privatization, and, uh, and, and they are the majority, so we had uh, sort of concrete proposals to address their circumstances as well. Ahora, nosotros, eh, para nosotros la recuperación de la educación pública no tiene que ver simplemente con que eh, la educación estatal, de propiedad estatal, empiece a recibir más recursos del Estado. Hoy día casi no recibe recursos directos del Estado, sino que también tiene que ver con el sentido que tiene que tener las instituciones que son públicas, es decir, como espacios públicos. Y para eso nosotros vemos al menos tres elementos fundamentales. Las instituciones públicas tienen que ser abiertas a la sociedad, es decir, que sean democráticas en el acceso. Una institución que se dice pública tiene que representar la diversidad socioeconómica, sociocultural, étnica, religiosa del país. No puede educar a un segmento simplemente. Uh, so what we meant by the, the, the recuperation of public education was not merely demanding more state funds for education. Certainly these are very little, but our demands went uh, much beyond that. We uh, insisted uh, about the, kind of the sense and meaning of public institutions, what uh, institutions that call themselves public must do and, and uh, must be. One of these uh, was that a public institution, or any institution that calls itself such, must be open to society, uh, must provide democratic uh, access, and must represent the diversity of the country uh, in terms of uh, class, religion, and, and, and any other sort of forms of difference. De hecho, nuestra demanda de gratuidad no tiene sentido si es que la universidad pública solamente educa una ley. Por eso es tan importante para nosotros la democratización y el acceso, como lo también nos señalaban los compañeros de antes. Pero también un segundo elemento tiene que ver con la democracia interna. Nosotros creemos que eh, la, la concepción del gobierno corporativo, que es como esto que se quiere introducir desde la visión de la universidad empresa, es totalmente contradictoria con la concepción de la universidad pública que tiene que garantizar espacios democráticos de participación de las comunidades estudiantes, profesores, trabajadores. De hecho, consideramos que esa forma de participación no solamente permite fiscalizar mejor cómo se destinan los recursos de la institución, sino que incluso permite hacer más eficiente el desarrollo de la institución. Porque permite no solamente educar en términos cívicos, sino que también que las comunidades se hagan cargo de la toma de decisiones, se hagan responsables del proceso de toma de decisiones. Um, with respect to the point about uh, openness and access, it's for this, uh, this is uh, crucial to our demand for a free edu uh, higher education, public higher education, because it, if for this to make sense, these institutions cannot just educate the elites. So the demand of access uh, and everything that comes with it uh, is crucial. Uh, another uh, issue here, however, for us was the issue of internal democracy. Uh, within educational institutions. Uh, uh, the structures of corporate governance, these, this kind of idea of the, corp the university corporation is completely anathema to uh, the, the idea of a public university uh, and uh, that we were putting forth, it, uh, and which included uh, proposals really to bring uh, decision making into the hands of those in those institutions in ways that would allow better oversight, in ways that would even make, you know, make these institutions more efficient by sort of handing responsibility over to the communities that are a part of the university community uh, and, and, and allowing them to take 
uh, those decision-making processes into their own hands. Y un tercer elemento tiene que ver con la democratización del conocimiento. Es decir, que el conocimiento que producen las instituciones públicas, sobre todo con la educación superior, que sean eh, de acceso público, que no sean propiedad exclusiva de una corporación, de una empresa privada. Y eso también tiene que ver con la autonomía, con el cierto grado de autonomía que tiene que tener una institución pública respecto a los intereses económicos de cierto grupo empresarial, a los intereses religiosos de determinada religión, para la redundancia, eh, o intereses de los gobiernos de turno, ¿cierto? Eh, los intereses que tiene que perseguir una institución pública tienen que ser los intereses de la gran mayoría, por lo tanto, el conocimiento que se genere dentro de esos establecimientos tiene que responder a esos intereses mayoritarios. And so uh, the third point uh, of, of proposals have to do with uh, the, the democratization of knowledge production. It seems uh, crucial that in a university that calls itself public, uh, mm -hmm. the knowledge uh, that is produced there needs to sort of reflect and be uh, at the service and meet the needs of the majorities of the population um, for this and not be holden to corporate or other kinds of interests. Uh, for this reason, uh, public institutions re require a degree of autonomy that will uh, permit them to not uh, be uh, dependent or tied to the interests uh, of corporations or of particular religious groups or any other sort of, uh, sort of dominant groups, but rather be able to generate uh, the, the knowledge that meets the needs of the majorities. It's okay. La educación eh, en el ámbito público no puede ser solamente entendida como un derecho ¿ya? social que tiene que ser garantizado por el Estado, sino que también tiene que ser entendida como una inversión social, como un bien público, donde la sociedad en su conjunto, a través del Estado, invierte en educación para transformarse a sí misma, ¿ya? para ir mejorando como sociedad. Y en ese sentido para consolidar o materializar esa visión de que la educación tiene que ser una inversión social, nosotros propusimos para financiar la educación una reforma tributaria. Porque en Chile el nivel de desigualdad es muy grande y el sistema tributario mantiene o incluso profundiza la desigualdad que hay, porque los más ricos no pagan impuestos. Entonces lo que le señalamos es que aquí todos tenemos que invertir a través del impuesto. Pero no que se le cargue a los más pobres como en Chile, sino que sea a los más ricos. Um, and so we uh, were also calling for uh, education not only as a right that needed to be guaranteed, but also as a social investment. Education as a public good through which society invests in itself through the state to better itself. Uh, and given this understanding, of course, we then also proposed a tax reform um, uh, a national, uh, to, the, to the national uh, to the system of taxation uh, uh, because it is an investment. Uh, uh, it was a tax reform in which um, the, the, the brunt of the costs of these proposals would go, you know, sort of fall progressively on the more wealthy sectors rather than having the burden fall on the poor sectors of society, which is the way things are today. Bueno, esa es una parte de nuestras propuestas, pero también señalamos varias cosas respecto al sistema privado, como recibe, por ejemplo, el fin al lucro, al fin al endeudamiento, por esto mismo, de entender la educación no como una inversión individual con la cual yo me tengo que endeudar y después pagar en función de mi rentabilidad privada, sino que eh, tiene que ser garantizado como un derecho y el lucro, evidentemente, es contradictorio con esa concepción. Ahora, nosotros tuvimos en 2011 a más de un millón y medio de personas en las calles. Tuvimos, como decía el Noam, una aprobación entre un 80 y un 90% de la población hacia nuestras demandas. Pero sin embargo, dentro de todas estas demandas estructurales que planteamos, poco nada conseguimos. Y eso a nosotros nos llevó a dar un paso más allá en la visión de sociedad que tenemos. Y lo que pasa es que, además, del problema generado en educación, hay una crisis que es mucho más profunda y estructural en nuestra sociedad y también tiene el mismo origen de la dictadura militar, que tiene que ver con nuestra institucionalidad política, 
con nuestro sistema democrático. ¿Ya? Que en este momento en Chile, así como está diseñado, no logra representar a la gran mayoría de los chilenos, sino que es un sistema que está pensado y diseñado para ser contrademocrático. Um, so in, in the context of these proposals, we also put forth uh, demands for an end to profit, fina lucro, an end to, uh, to debt, to student debt, uh, because uh, these not the notion of both profit and the idea that one gets indebted for an education um, sort of contradict this, like, this understanding of education as a right. And during 2011, as Noam was explaining, we had about one and a half million people in the streets, and, uh, and we, our approval in the, in, in, in the polling was that 80 to 90 percent of the population was with us and in our favor. Um, but we uh, got very few of the demands that we asked for, and this led us to thinking and, and, and talking about another crisis that's in, in Chile that's much deeper in a sense, and it's the crisis of political institutions and the, the, the political system. As it is designed, and it was designed by the same people who implemented this model of education during the dictatorship, uh, the Chilean political system is designed to be anti-democratic. And this is where then uh, the movement also began to speak uh, around these issues. Sí, nosotros creemos que um, el movimiento social por la educación no solamente develó, como decíamos anteriormente, la crisis en el modelo educativo, sino que devela la crisis de nuestro modelo de desarrollo, tanto en el plano económico como en el plano político, de cómo se mantiene este. ¿Y por qué? Porque cuando nosotros eh, hablamos de que los derechos, y en particular el derecho a la educación, tiene que ser garantizado por el Estado, implica que el Estado ya no sea un Estado subsidiario, es decir, un Estado neoliberal, sino que es un Estado garante en materia de derecho. Cuando nosotros señalamos que teníamos que poner fin al lucro con nuestros derechos, no solamente en la educación, sino que también en la salud, por ejemplo, eh, señalamos o cuestionamos de alguna otra forma el pilar fundamental también del modelo neoliberal, que es, está basado en su patrón acumulativo. Y, y en esa demanda, Evidentemente que generamos un, un remesón o una, una delegitimación de la hegemonía o del sentido común neoliberal. Y ante eso, ¿qué es lo que sucede? ¿Termino acá? No. <risa> lo que sucede es que los sectores que están más arriba, ¿cierto?, en, en el poder tanto económico como político, no iban a ceder. Porque ceder en eso era el cuestionar todo su modelo. Y yo creo que hoy día, eh, a propósito de eso, lo, el gran desafío que tenemos nosotros como movimiento estudiantil y movimiento social, no es solamente exigir la democratización de la educación, sino que la democratización de nuestro país entero. Porque lo único que ha tenido, o sea, la única consecuencia que ha tenido eh, estos 30 años de modelo neoliberal en nuestro país, es la profunda concentración del poder político, del poder económico, del poder de los medios de comunicación. Y eso no es democracia. Efectivamente no es democracia. Entonces... Entire uh, model, political, economic, and otherwise, 
which led certainly the upper echelons of society and elites uh, precisely to uh, dig in and really not see because their entire kind of vision and, and project of society that they built over the past 30 years was being questioned. And so I think our, the biggest challenge that we face now is uh, that, we do not, that we don't only need uh, the dem uh, democratization of education, um, but we need uh, the uh, uh, democratization of the entire country uh, because of the uh, profound sort of, sort of concentrations of wealth and the profound inequalities in Chile uh, that have happened under neoliberalism are simply not democracy. En síntesis, en Chile resolvimos el problema de la dictadura militar, pero no resolvimos nunca el problema del modelo que dejaron. Entonces, efectivamente, nosotros, si bien esta juventud, que muchos de nosotros nacimos en el 88, quizá un poquito antes, eh, no vivimos la dictadura militar y la violencia eh, física, psicológica que eso conllevó, pero sí estamos viviendo las consecuencias y el resultado en términos de la política económica, de la mala calidad de nuestra democracia, ¿cierto? Y eso nos plantea el desafío hoy día a la juventud de transformar nuestra sociedad, de recuperar nuestras heridas. Entonces yo creo, eh, y para ir cerrando, de que eh, en Chile se puede ilumbrar eh, un cuestionamiento profundo ese relato del fin de la historia. Yo creo que eh, lo que motivó a muchas de las generaciones del 60, 70 en nuestro país hoy día se vuelve a resignificar. Y aquellos que dijeron que ya no había posibilidad de construir un mundo distinto, que, no, que las luchas de los movimientos sociales eran particulares, geniales, hoy día se derrumban. Hoy día se perfila, creo yo, desde el punto de vista de que se puede configurar un movimiento social y político que se plantee un nuevo orden social. Y en eso creo yo que estamos trabajando no solamente los estudiantes, sino que muchas otras organizaciones sociales en Chile que se están levantando pero que son invisibilizadas. De trabajadores, de pobladores, de movimientos medioambientalistas, el pueblo mapuche. Todo ello hoy día, sin sí, aplauso para el pueblo mapuche.
social order. Uh, we are, and the students are, have, you know, are, are playing a key role in this, but many other organizations and many other sort of struggles are, are taking an active role in this. Uh, there's a kind of the labor struggles, uh, environmental struggles, the Mapuche people and their struggle. Uh, they're, they're, they're currently uh, Mapuche their political prisoners are on the 48th day for hunger strike, and it would be great if some support could be sent their way um, for them to help them counter the, the sort of criminalization and the state terrorism that they've been submitted to uh, for decades, if not centuries. Um, but uh, I, the key task and the challenge is in many ways that there has been a fissure, a crack made in this kind of hegemonic model, and our role is to broaden that, that, that fissura, broaden that, that, that uh, crack in, the, in that wall, uh, and um, build, uh, imagine and, and, and build um, uh, uh, alternatives, uh, both at a, at a national and at a global level, and something that I believe is not only possible, but urgent and necessary. the 
NYPD or in the, the police force, uh, the ability to stop anyone who may be as suspicious of any crime, and often this leads to racial profiling. Um, and also the criminalization of the undocumented community, especially in the Southwest, with uh, laws like uh, the ones in Arizona uh, that criminalize uh, being outside without proper documentation and also lead to racial profiling. Um, I think that in that sense, when we talk about uh, a student movement in New York City, being that it's very diverse, we have to deal with also these issues within these communities because we do have a high population of Latino and Black and uh, undocumented students. Um, in terms of the repression against activists and specifically student organizers, I think that uh, in New York City, as well as in California, after there was mass mobilization of students, there was the practice of repression, um, you know, whether that's through uh, tear gas, uh, pepper spray, uh, with students who were doing sitting, who were doing peaceful demonstrations, also police brutality at pro student protests. Um, I know that at the November protest in Baruch, there was uh, police repression and brutality, and since then, there has been the practice of uh, student organizers being tracked, of uh, student, or, uh, if student organized events being monitored. Uh, there is a surveillance of the Muslim uh, community within universities, but also outside of the university in communities. Um, so when I talk about the general criminalization of kind of both by law and practice, um, I'm really speaking of the essence that we have in, in really seeing that the university is a reflection. And like how many of you said it very effectively, um, oftentimes we see that a student movement that really wants radical change has to also speak to the radical change in the broader society.
que eh, de alguna otra forma, más que apoyarnos nosotros, hicieron un llamado al propio, bueno, están en elecciones, pero a los dos dan un punto, eh, a que, no, de, o sea, como que dejen de ver que Latinoamérica es un patio trasero y paren con el intervencionismo y particularmente quiten esa base militar.